um, you, uh, you you said that you would you would veto a bill, Correct. on bouncer bill that came to your desk. Uh, uh, it is is it, there are people who say. That, that Wendy Davis would not be able to get along with a Republican legislature, so what's the point? Uh, what is the point? Well, I think that's just not true. Um, first of all, I've gotten along very well with my Republican colleagues in the legislature, including, uh, believe it or not, Dan Patrick. <laughs> I don't think most people would, would put uh, Dan Patrick and Wendy Davis together in the same sentence ideologically, but we've actually worked very well together um, on the charter school bill is, is a prime example of that. Um, and, and really, that's what I think our legislature is looking for. Uh, someone who's not going to function through a partisan lens, someone who's going to invite uh, all voices to be at the table. It hasn't been the conditions under which we've been working, in my experience, in the last six years in the legislature. But it's my background. Um, you all know, of course, that I come from the city council in, in this great city. And I loved learning how to be a public servant in that context, because working without partisan affiliations next to our name meant that we, we had some really constructive working arrangements, and I'd like to set the tone for doing that in the legislature as well. Okay. Um, uh, uh, other questions for, from other people? I don't want to monopolize the conversation. You know, your, your uh, supporters have been very inspired by your life story. Uh, recently, that has uh, been somewhat controversial. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, my life story is my life story, Jim. And I know there's been some quibbling over detail, but I am who I am, and my, my perspective as a public servant, my desire to even be in public service, is formed by the basis of my life experiences. I bring that to the table with me every single day, and it, what, it is what forms the fight that I have for people. I think I have a record that reflects the fact that I'm a fighter for people, whether it's in the consumer reform arena, whether it's in the education arena, uh, whether it's in the, the healthcare arena. Um, I am a person who fights for the people that she represents. And that came from my personal life story and my understanding of what it's like to struggle. You think there's been too much uh, back and forth on the precise details? I, I, I do, I do. Um, and, and you know, it is what it is. Um, I'm forging ahead and working hard, talking about the alternative that I would provide for Texas and the vision that I would bring, the values that I will reflect in my priorities. And I feel confident that the things that I'm talking about um, the priorities that I've set and will continue to lay out over the course of the next few months are reflective of the values of Texans because that's who I am. I am a Texan and I don't think about things through a partisan lens. Um, I think it's why I've had the, the privilege of serving the Senate district that I've represented for the last six years one which you know was drawn for a Republican to represent. And, and still, uh, if you just looked at the numbers, would tell you that a Republican should be representing it. But I've had the privilege of serving it because I've, I think, uh, worked hard to connect with people at their values and to reflect those in the work that I'm doing in the Texas legislature. Do you think your gender is a reason for the extra scrutiny, or is that not it? In play. You know, politics is war, right? <laughs> um, and you, you feel like you're at war? Right? Well, in, in, in some respects. Um, I, I feel like I have a very legitimate candidacy. Um, for the first time, I think in a long time, people in Texas believe we have the opportunity to perhaps select someone with a D next to their name uh, as our executive officer in this state. 
and the folks who have been in charge uh, for the last 20 years aren't going to give that up without a fight. So I expect the next nine months we'll see more of the same. But that does not deter me from forging ahead, talking about my priorities, uh, talking with the folks across the state about what I hope to bring to them as their next governor if I have the privilege of being elected to serve them. You've given some clarity a, a bit on the abortion issue and on the gun issue, uh, but there are even some Democrats who think you're trying to walk back the position on those issues to try to appeal to more people. Uh, number one, is that the case? Number two, Will we see Wendy Davis with a shotgun at the beginning of the <laughs> season, a la Ann Richards, uh, to prove that you really do love guns? Yeah, I'm not trying to walk anything back. No, I am who I am. Um, and obviously, you know, as a girl who grew up in Texas, we may not fit exactly the same slot that folks might think that a person with a D next to their name fits. Um, I was given as a gift at a dinner in Austin recently uh, Ann Richards shotgun from her kids. So there may be a chance for me to use that on the campaign trail, but in the meantime I'll just be, be very proud that, that they thought enough of me to give me such a, a precious gift from their mom. Wendy, when you stand on casino gambling in Texas? I've always said that I believe that issue should be decided by the voters of Texas, and I would advance a bill that allows the voters of Texas to make that decision. Well, I wanted to ask you about the health care law and Medicaid expansion. Yes. I know that you were supportive or you would have liked to have seen Medicaid be expanded in the state, and Governor Perry obviously did not want to. Um, it's, it's not always a popular position to take for, for various reasons. Um, in, in Wisconsin, for example, Governor Walker proposed an alternative to Medicaid expansion that would get more people into the exchange by giving the state subsidies. Um, what is your perspective on that kind of alternative? Well, talk about Medicaid first of all, and sure. your, your, um, any possible ideas that you have to get more people insured that wouldn't expand Medicaid. Sure. Well, I think we can find a Texas solution to bring our tax money back down from Washington. And I think when presented with a real understanding of what's at stake here, most Texans would agree. We have, over the next 10 years, the opportunity to draw down approximately $100 billion in our tax money that we've sent uh, and will be sending to the federal level that will go elsewhere to insure people in New York and California rather than here in Texas. And Ray Perryman has, of course, written a very compelling economic analysis of what that means for Texas. It's his uh, prediction that the drawdown of, of those revenues would create about 300,000 jobs per year, uh, which is extraordinary. And they, it can't be understated what that means for the Texas economy. At the same time, of course, uh, between a million and a million and a half people, hardworking people who fit in that gap uh, between the existing Medicaid coverage in Texas and the uh, supplement under the Affordable Care Act could be insured. That creates a healthier economy too because it creates a, a healthier workforce. I think that Texas must um, not take the risk of, of turning those resources away. And we should go to the table as other states have done. Arkansas is another example. and devise our own solution to draw those dollars down. Yet, yet those, those dollars have been treated uh, in Texas as a Trojan horse, that they will um, explode the Texas budget. Is that true? No, it's not true. And in fact, again, you know, going back to the, the cost of, of what we pay as a state if we don't bring those dollars down. Uh, all of our hospitals across the state and, and our hospitals here in, in the local Fort Worth community have been very vocal on this issue. During the Affordable Care Act negotiations, hospitals agreed that they would give up the uh, disproportionate share money that they were getting from the federal government where they were disproportionately 
taking on a share of caring for people who were uninsured in exchange for the Medicaid expansion. And when the Supreme Court made its decision, of course, uh, states like Texas, who decided they didn't want to participate in the Medicaid expansion, uh, had their hospitals wind up in the lose-lose end of that bargain. There is no question that that cost will be borne somewhere. And for Texas, what that means is that our property taxes, our local property taxes, which fund, of course, the charitable care components of our county uh, hospital systems, are going to have to bear the brunt of that burden. It makes no sense uh, that we would bear the full cost of that charitable care through our local economies versus bringing our own tax dollars back down to help cover the majority of those costs. Could I ask your opinion of the death penalty and how you think that we should go forward? I mean, first of all, before or against, but how it is administered in this state, your opinion? I do believe uh, in the death penalty in, in instances of heinous crimes, uh, but I am concerned about uh, Texas. We see that the exoneration rate in Texas is the highest, I, I think, in the country. There was a report that I read recently on that. And obviously that compels us to take a, a very close look at our criminal justice system here, where we can assure guilt of someone who's committed a heinous crime. I have no hesitation about imposition of the death penalty. But the ABA, of course, has uh, given some guidance on making sure that we have in place proper safeguards, um, that we as states across the country are working to include those safeguards. And I think that Texas really needs to, to uh, adhere to the recommendations that, that they're making. Um, I'm very proud of work that's happening in Texas to try to make sure that we're going back and looking back at people who are incarcerated now to assure that we truly are holding guilty people in our prison cells. Um, Craig Watkins, of course, in Dallas has you know, a pretty exemplary record of self-initiating that kind of work. Um, the Innocence Project work in Texas, of course, has a, a very good record in that arena as well. Um, and so I think we just need to be sensitive to understanding that sometimes in our justice system, mistakes are made and we have to give the greatest care possible before we meet out the greatest penalty possible.